There's been a lot of talk about investing in gold as a safe haven asset given what's been going on in Eastern Europe. But what about the miners? Let's take a look at how we can leverage our play to gold if indeed that is the right play currently. Here to discuss this with us is John Fennick. He is the consultant and portfolio manager of John Fennick Consulting. Welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, David. Nice to be here. John, last time I spoke to you was actually in uh, the Beaver Creek Conference uh, a while back. Right. Uh, lots has changed uh, in terms of geopolitics around the world. Not a lot has changed for the gold price. We have seen a nice rally in the gold price in the beginning of the year. Uh, but more significantly, I'm seeing a rally in the GDXJ, the Junior Gold Miners Index. So uh, we'll talk about that in just a minute. But let's, get the, uh, let's set the stage, so to speak, for the uh, investment landscape of gold. Inflation has gone up, as you know, 7.5% headline CPI is the highest in 40 years. Uh, some economists have spoken to are projecting even higher levels of inflation going forward. What does this mean for gold? So I think the key thing for me was when Powell kind of admitted this, right, uh, from the Fed in November, he he basically said publicly, like, we admit that we got this wrong. And we've been talking about this, David, on your show since the summer of last year, that CPI was going to get, you know, higher and stay higher. And, you know, we took a different um, approach, I guess, to that. And we've been fully invested through most of the difficult part of 2021 as a result, because we thought that that's going to eventually, you know, uh, raise gold and silver prices and therefore raise the mining prices. Right. And so um, now I don't think anyone, I think it's on everyone's mind. If you go to a hotel, if you rent a, a rental car, if you, you know, go and, and buy just generic stuff like, you know, beef or, 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 or get, get your gas tank filled. I mean, this is really impacting not only the U.S. investor, but the global investor. So it's, it's a real problem. And, uh, and so I think, go ahead, David. No, no, you, please, you go ahead. So I, I feel that, you know, CPI is, is definitely going to rage higher for a while and it's going to be a persistent problem. We'll see if, if, if that's true on March 10th when the next read comes. But uh, there's no question in my mind that the Fed is going to raise regardless of what that number is on March 16th. It's just if we were to have this interview just a few weeks earlier, we were looking at a 65 percent probability of a 50 basis point rate hike, rate hike from the Fed. And now that is completely out the window. Exactly. So now, yeah, exactly. So it's uh, I was looking at the Fed watch tool from the CMA the other day, 50 uh, percent, sorry, 50 basis point to 75 basis point. I believe that probability for that uh, that bracket is like 2.7 or something very low. Um, so right. let's 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 assume the market's right and we can rule that out. Uh, but let's talk about what inflation is going to do. So you mentioned that inflation is not going to have a direct impact on the Fed anyway, because like you said, if inflation doesn't go up in either in either case, the Fed has to raise rates by at least 25 basis points. Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is, as we, as we were to have this, you know, again, a few weeks ago, that the consensus amongst big banks in the U.S. was four rate hikes, maybe five, depending on who you were reading, right? No one was at two. No one was at three. We're talking like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, you know, the big names. So when I think that when I look at today's situation, right, with all that's happened with the, with the momentum stock selling off and having this Russian tension, how are you going to raise rates four or five times in this environment right now? You know, I, I think in, in hearing Powell testify this week, he was very guarded, uh, much more guarded than he was in, in January or, or even February. So I think the Fed is realizing that this situation in Russia is fluid and they have to just watch what's happening and, and make assessments accordingly. OK, well, regardless of uh, what the Fed does, uh, what the, one of the more important indicators or the drivers of the gold price, rather, is the real interest rate. So. Let's take a look at uh, what the real interest rate has been doing over the last past uh, past year or so. It's been in negative territory, and analysts have spoken to have said that, again, regardless of what the Fed does, it's not enough to raise a real interest rate back into positive ter territory. So negative real interest rates should be good for gold, they argue. Now, here's my counter argument, and I'd like you to respond to this, John. Yes, you're right. I mean, everyone's right in the sense that negative real interest rates are good for gold. But look at where real interest rates have been in the last year and a half. They've been negative, but they've been flat. And so the gold price has also been flat. I would argue that it's more the direction of the real interest rate that matters more than the absolute level. So even if we stay flat and negative territory, that still doesn't mean gold's going to go anywhere. 
how would you respond? Um, you know, as an equity person in, in this sector, I'm less concerned about the gold price than your average guest, right? I oh, still okay. think that, you know, you know, when we looked at the the um, situation when we last met David in the fall, right, we were at 1750 to 1850 gold per ounce all day long for months. And and we, we were of the, the belief that we would break the 1850 to the upside, which we have. But even so, like, you're just seeing this reaction, a positive reaction from the mining complex now that we've broken 1850 and now 1900 and now 1950, right? So we're taking out these major resistance levels, uh, but we're doing it in a methodic way, which I like. We're not seeing gold go up 3%, 4% in a day, right? Which I, I you know, w- wouldn't want to see. I, I like this gradual move higher towards the, the key $2,000, you know, round number. Um, but I do believe that, you know, we're going to retest the summer of 2020 highs in the gold price, which means that's why, you know, to your point at the onset, you want to have leverage to that. And that's why we own no gold right now. We own gold stocks hand over fist. Well, let's talk about the gold stocks. I know you are an investor in uh, primarily juniors, but I want to touch on the seniors first and uh, how they've okay. been performing. Now, um, a lot of people have told me that which is what we've been seeing for a while. Yes, it's not really the all-time highs like we saw two years ago, but $1,800 is still very good for equities, they argue. They argue that at $1,800, the miners, the seniors are making very good cash flow. Well, I'm not so sure about that because I'm taking a look at Barrick, for example, just as a proxy. I'm not talking about all miners, just one Mm -hmm. of the bigger ones. Barrick, uh, in 2020, their free cash flow was $3.3 billion. In 2021, that dropped to $1.9 billion of free cash flow. Uh, That's a 42% decrease year over year. Now, their stock has also reflected that. They haven't done very well over 2021. Now, I'm just saying that, yes, their $1,800, their top line revenue hasn't really decreased. It's just their costs have gone up. Their all-in sustaining costs, for example, went from 967 an ounce to over 1,000, so uh, uh, 1026 an ounce was their latest uh, all-in sustaining costs. So their margins are starting to feel the pressure from inflation, higher energy costs, and all that. So I'm just arguing, uh, John, like uh, all these analysts saying that $1,800 has been good for the uh, equities, uh, they haven't really taken into account inflation eating away at their margins, right? That's true. And, and if you've looked at some of the juniors that have launched what we call a PFS uh, study recently here, you know, they've, they've They've shown a higher capex in their um, report uh, because the cost, the input costs, have gone up dramatically, right? In the commodities complex, so that to me is worrisome. Uh, as you pointed out, you know, probably margins are being hit a little bit here because energy keeps raging higher, and if you're a producer, you need energy, right, to to run the rates. So it's it's there are some concerns like that out there to me, but I think the broader theme should be that you know i worked in the in the mutual fund etf business all my life before starting my my company and large cap value manager mentality is give me something cheap that pays a reasonable dividend Mm -hmm. that is like newmont all the way right like it's it's a stock we don't own other than through our exposure in gdx right now but if you look at that chart you know december 15th on the fed day it was at 51 bucks it hasn't looked back it crossed 74 bucks today on high volume and it's yielding, you know, 3.2%. So it's very attractive to the mutual fund and ETF community, I think. And you're going to start seeing more people buy the beaten up names, like you said, like Barrick, right? At 1026 an ounce, if you're at 1900, you're still making whatever that is, $874 an ounce, like a margin. It's insane. Okay. Uh, well, look, the, the, the margins are good, but when can we start seeing that uh, being reflected in the share price, you think? Yeah, that obviously people are... We did a long time for that, right? And so what my, my and, and let me, I let me just let me just sorry let me let me just uh, uh, let me just uh, give a disclaimer that Barrick has done very well year to date. I think they're up like twenty percent since the beginning mm-hmm. of the year. So I'm not saying they've been you know an underperformer at all. I mean over the last year, yes, everyone's stocks have gone down, but people are starting to see a bit of a rebound. But yes, continue. Yeah, so I think um, people have been very patient in our sector. You know, there's been. A lot of people that couldn't handle the volatility. We always talk about, you know, understand what your risk, your personal risk is, and and how that, you know, uh, is is reflected in your goals and 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 dreams. You know, it's like you can't just <laughs> buy stocks and, and cross your fingers. That's not a strategy. So, yeah. you know, with the, the large cap space, it's a good place for the average investor to start. 
And you can do that through buying something like GDX because it holds a lot of the names we just talked about, right? It has big positions in Newmont, Barrick, et cetera. Um, but it's, you know, to, to us, like being a more sophisticated portfolio management team, we're looking at the mid caps and the small caps and the okay. micro caps because now we think Newmont has already made a move, right? So we're, we're looking at where, you know, as Gretzky says, where, you know, skate to where the puck is going. The puck is going towards the small cap stuff now and the mid cap stuff. And we want to be positioned in those names. So let's talk about that sector, the uh, mid-tiers and the juniors. As an investor, how would you like to see that space beat inflation? In other words, how can the juniors and the mid-tiers keep their margins up in a rising cost environment? Yeah, sure. So a lot of CEOs in the mining space will come to me and ask me my opinion about different things. And, and one of those frequently is, hey, um, I, I want to attend this conference, but it costs X amount of money to do that, right? You think this is a good investment? And my my answer it depends on the um, it depends on the people that are running the the event. It depends on how many competitors are going to be at the event. It depends on how many investors will be at the event, right? Like if you um, only have you know if you have twenty nine companies attending something, that's good. You're one of twenty nine. You're not one of one hundred and fifty. But how many investors with real capital are showing up to actually listen to what you're saying, right? So right. why pay that 10 or 15 grand? Um, why not just do more Zoom meetings and one-on-ones with, with investors or do, you know, I, I, I frequently interview people and I don't, I don't charge them to do that. So like, you know, I'll, I'll open it up to my network and just have a personal, you know, 30 minutes with a CEO and my, and my clients and followers really like that because it gives them some insights that they may not be able to get directly from, uh, you know, a, a long, you know, report. So you think SG&A costs are too high? I do. I mean, uh, that's been a problem with our sector for many years. And so it's getting better, but it still isn't fixed. I wonder how inflation has affected the juniors. I mean, producers, it's obvious the energy costs, trucks and all that, that it's gone up. But the juniors and mid-tiers who aren't producing yet, it, does it really matter that oil is at $100? To me, no. It's, okay. it's the producers that would feel that crunch. Okay. So let's talk about the juniors then. GDXJ has had a great run. So you're sure. saying that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that they're immune to cost inflation, are they? Would you make that statement? No, uh, I agree with you. I mean, there's, there's not an immunity there. But um, remember, like we talked about this when we first met in the summer of last year. You know, we, we talked about GDXJ and we said that, you know, if you bought and held GDXJ for five years, um, you made no money. You actually lost money. And um, it's it's an ETF that rebalances every 90 days. Um, it's a good place to start for an average investor. But we, we recommend working with a professional like myself or someone like me to guide you to cherry pick some of those names because just buying a basket sometimes doesn't work, right? You've got You've got road blockages, weather issues, political issues. All these things factor into the holdings of any ETF. All right. So in your opinion, what has been the main reason behind uh, GDX, GDXJ's run? We're at, uh, I'm looking at the charts, almost $47, so 46.57 mm-hmm. today at the close. Uh, a year ago, it was trading at around uh, 42 And at the lows around January 27th uh, of this year, which is not even three months ago, it was at 37 so, mm-hmm. yes, the gold price has rallied this year um, since the beginning of the year, but uh, the GDXJ has gone up even more. I'm guessing that's because junior miners are highly levered to the gold price. Is that, is that the only right. reason, though? Yeah, no. Uh, the, the other reason would be like what we talked about, that big money is starting to recognize the value in our sector, right? And, and when portfolio managers start putting even a little bit of money to work in our sector, it's really going to make a difference, as you've seen, just using Newmont again as an example, NEM. If you look at that chart, it's a beautiful looking chart. And, and you know, large cap value managers, small cap value managers, whoever, they're, they're, they're going to recognize this and start buying that or GDX or GDXJ. Now, why do you think that January 27th was the low? Two things. One, January 26th, if I'm remembering correctly, was the Fed. And that was the intraday low on both GDX and J yeah. um, for the year. Um, secondly, You've seen a lot of momentum stocks sell off during that time in January as as well as in February, correct? So 
there's finally a way for a long short portfolio manager to actually short something other than our sector, right? You can short um, a num- you can short travel, you can short tech, you can short other things now because we've seen some really waterfall declines in some of these names. All right. So as a fund manager, do you prefer to just buy the index, the GDXJ, or do you pick stocks? What do you do? We use what we call a hub and spoke structure. So we'll buy maybe 5% GDX, 5% GDXJ, and then we'll put the other 90% to work in metals and miners. And, and the, where we get the most upside potential from our, from our picks is obviously in the junior space. So if I could, I'll just go through a couple that may be of interest. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, just to, to clarify, you, you buy a little bit of the GDX and the GDXJ and you buy miners. I'm guessing the stocks you buy individually are not in either of those indices? No, they would be. Sometimes we'll have oh, a little just overlap. buy one um, and over- amplify it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I see. Um, we, right. use, we use um, the GDX and J as, as hubs and, 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 and mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the juniors as spokes. You know, so, so we'll try to get exposure to different things that those indexes or, excuse me, ETFs wouldn't get exposure to, right? Yeah. So um, I'll just go through a couple of metals here, David. Yeah, sorry. And before, you before, you, uh, before we get into the names, I'm just curious as to your strategy again. So do you, do you uh, change mm-hmm. your weightings at all depending on, I guess, macro conditions or the price of the gold? Uh, you mentioned 5% GDX, 5% GDXJ. Uh, so basically, portfolio allocation, stocks versus your cash holdings. Do you change that at all? Yeah, we, we're changing stuff every week. I mean, it, it, we're very active managers. Um, we're looking at you know this Russia situation, and we've disagreed with a lot of people that uh, geopolitics don't matter. They absolutely do matter, and you're seeing that you know with the February 11th news starting things off on that Friday, Palladium PAL, which I talked about on your last show, um, was at 204. It traded up to 279 today. I'm not sure where it closed, but. You know, that's the kind of thing where Russia is producing 40% of the world's palladium, roughly, right? It's like there, there's a real concern um, from car makers and others that use palladium that, you know, Putin might do something to shut off the exports of palladium, right? So you need to buy it now at any price. And that's what we've been talking about. We're not, we don't believe in investing because of fear. We believe in investing because of supply, demand, and balances, right? Since I've met you, we've talked about copper being, you know, short at the exchanges, right? We've bought a lot of copper miners as a result. Palladium, same thing. Um, you know, rhodium, same thing. You can go down a long list. Nickel made an all-time high today, I think, or a multi-year high. It's like there's so many things that you can point to that are doing well, but frustratingly, so many of the miners are just starting to catch up. Okay. All right. Some picks then. Sure. So in the gold space, you know, we've talked about GDX and J as very good alternatives. Um, one that stands out that isn't in either of those is U.S. Gold, which is USAU. Um, in full disclosure, it is something we own. And it's uh, I actually flew out and visited them in Wyoming last year at their CK mine. was very impressed with the operation. It's three miles from Martin Marietta. Um, Martin Marietta has a very successful aggregate business, and they have a lot of aggregate to sell. So... There's things like that that I look for that are very difficult for the average investor to see through a report uh, because it may be buried in there. But you know, you think to yourself, if they've got four 100 uh, percent owned projects all in the U.S., why do they need all four? They could sell something like that to Martin Marietta and fund their other operations so they don't dilute shareholders, right? I'm just saying that 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 could be a possibility. Um, but the real expiration upside there to me is at Maggie Creek in Nevada. Uh, I could see them, you know partnering with someone in the, in the space, you know, like a, a larger name here within the next few months, because there's just a need, as you know, David, for production from some of these majors, right? Um, so in the silver space, I would say you can do the same thing as you're doing with gold and, and buy something like SILJ, which is the junior silver ETF. Um, or you could buy something like uh, Golden Minerals, which is AUMN, which is one of our picks as well, to be, uh, to be full, full disclosure. I've known that company for 12 years. I've known the CEO for seven years. You know, we don't just trade names. We, we really try to build relationships with some of the senior people at these companies and get an idea of when to invest more and when to pull back a little bit. Um, they're, uh, they've gone directly last year from Explorco to a producer, which is rare. Um, and they're you know, producing gold and, and silver right now, but it's predominantly a silver play in my view. 
Um, if you switch over to copper, copper uh, crossed that key four dollars and seventy six a pound yesterday, which is amazing. We've all been talking about four dollars, you know, being resistance, and then it was four fifty for a long time. Well, now four seventy six is taken out, and you're headed towards five bucks. And from every copper CEO I talk to, five dollars is the magic number for getting, you know, invested. So we've got ahead of that with a couple names recently. Uh, a new one for us is Trilogy. Um, I'm thinking that ticker is TMQ. I'm just looking at my keyboard to make sure I get it right. But we started that around 95 cents this week because they had some really bad news. Um, and we think that the news is overblown. Um, we also uh, bought a junior uh, recently called uh, Braveheart Resources, which is R-I-I-N-F. Um, by the way, all of these tickers are US tickers uh, for your audience. Um, and it's trading just over five cents, and it, it you know it focuses on copper at its number one uh, project and palladium at its number two project. Um, if you do the homework, they bought that palladium project, I think, for under a million dollars, and uh, uh, it's worth a lot more money now uh, in just uh, less than two years. So we look for those kind of weird you know uh, things that the market hasn't caught on to yet because there's no analyst coverage. Um, and wrapping up, you know, a couple others for you. Palladium, um, you know, I wrote on Palladium for Sprott. I have a real interest in that sector of the market. Um, two of our favorite names there are, are again, lesser known names. Uh, Canadian Palladium, DCNNF. Um, they just came out with their 43101 port report this week. Very strong. Um, they've got a pit there uh, with a resource that I think the, 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 the uh, report didn't discuss, but we think that would get them started faster than the market's giving them you know, credit for at this point. And um, in, in looking where their jurisdiction is in Sudbury, in that area, there's a ton of M&A over the last few years. Um, so we like them as a, as a name that would probably get taken out down the road here, not you know, probably into next year. Um, we also like um, Transition Metals, which is TNTMF. Um, I'll just say of all the names I just mentioned, that's probably the most illiquid. Uh, so you have to be very careful with entering bids um, on that. Um, but it is something that owns us uh, a portion of Sunday Lake, which is another palladium deposit that I like. Uh, and uh, they partner with Impala, I believe, on that. So, you know, it, it's a really interesting stock that's underfollowed. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in wrapping up um, in the nickel space, because I just mentioned nickel was up over six and a half percent to start the day today. Um, I think that uh, you've seen some disruption, right? With Norilsk, um, N-I-L-S-Y is an ADR, a Russian ADR. They got um, halted yesterday by all exchanges. So I don't know what's going to happen with Russian production, but when you look at how much production comes out of that name alone, I think Nickel Juniors make a lot of sense right now. The price is going higher. Now you have this Norilsk issue. So we like FPX, uh, which is symbol F-P-O-C-F in the U.S., They've got uh, two big targets in Canada, Baptiste and Van, that have just produced fantastic drill results. And the stock is not responding much at all at this point, which is probably just a matter of time in our view. It's in a great jurisdiction. Um, secondly, we would also, uh, in the nickel space, let me think. Uh, yeah, so PGEZF, which is group 10, um, is 42% nickel, even though people think of them mostly as a uh, you know, rhodium and palladium play. Um, they actually have quite a bit of exposure to nickel and they're directly right. next door to Sabanye. Uh, so we like that play in Montana. What do you think of Kinvoss uh, shutting down their Russian operations? News came out a couple days ago. Yeah, we own no KGC at this point. Um, I know they're doing that deal with Great Bear and um, it'll be interesting to see you know, how that stock trades. But uh, obviously that is a holding in GDX and J and, and has been for many years. Um, uh, that's going to hurt them uh, near term, most likely, and and uh, I'm not sure how how that's going to all work. But um, that's why we really can, you know just continue to pound home to investors. You need to have a conversation with someone like me or someone else in the sector that can help you understand political risk. It's very important. We're going to have to have you back on to uh, give an exclusive masterclass on how to pick junior stocks. I think that would be very useful for uh, investors following your, your service and your work. All right, thanks, John. I appreciate your insights. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks so much, David. I appreciate it. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lin. Stay tuned for more.